Okay, I'm going to start. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session of TMTV focused around planning data. Uh, some of you may have joined us before, some of you may not have done. Obviously, today we're going to discuss uh, planning and the reliance upon planning data with events of the last 12 months. Obviously, lots of people now looking to move out of the heavily urbanised areas and into semi-rural or rural properties. And with that, there's a big, big, big increase in interest in planning data. Ally that alongside the, the need for sustainable development and increased housing. Um, and obviously we have a, a perfect storm where planning is talked about in just about every conversation I have with law firms at the moment. So very happy to be joined today by Max Jarney from Landhawk, Stuart Time, sorry, Stuart Tim, I knew I was going to say that, from Erwin Mitchell and Paul <laughs> Addison from Devices. Just going to hand over to the guys here just uh, if they want to give us a very brief introduction. So Stuart Sins that I pronounced your surname incorrectly straight away. Why don't you start? I just want to give the, the group an introduction. Yeah, I'm a, um, a senior associate at Erwin Mitchell. We're a law firm uh, and I'm a specialist in planning law, part of the planning and environment team. So I've got 10 to 15 years of uh, practice experience in this area. Brilliant, thank you. Max, do you want to give yourself a brief introduction? Sure, so uh, I'm a geospatial analyst and product manager at Landhawk. So we're a software service. We provide a geospatial intelligence to essentially enable, empower land agents, planners, and development managers to make more responsible and informed planning decisions through our software platform, APIs, and consultancy services. Thank you very much, Max. And uh, last but by no means least, Paul, do you want to give us a quick introduction? Yeah, good morning. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Addison. I'm the managing director and founder of Devassist. Um, we provide detailed uh, location reports for property buyers um, using planning data and policy and other things, which I'm sure we will be discussing over the next hour. Fantastic. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to all our, our uh, viewers this morning, or well, now indeed into the afternoon. So I guess the, the, the first thing to um, ask of all of our panellists, really, with this increase in appetite for planning data and the amount of data available from a, a huge uh, variety of sources across both local authorities, various uh, aggregators and suppliers. What do we really need to be paying attention to and uh, what, what is the value of this planning data within the property market? So any, anyone want to start on a, a thought on that? I'm happy to kick off. Um... We use planning data on, on every report that we do. Um, planning data is, it is just absolutely deal critical on any purchase, whether it be residential or commercial. It's, it's an absolute insight into a location. Um, it displays uh, intent, it displays motives, desires. Um, so when you look at it on a large scale, every bit of planning history in a location is very revealing. It will, may reveal that your neighbours uh, have a desire to increase the size of their house. It may reveal that the field at the bottom of your garden um, is currently being promoted for development and has not been disclosed by the existing vendor. So um, it, it is, for, for me, planning is essential, albeit it is part of a bigger subject. And, and Stuart, I guess with, with yourself dealing with um, planning and planning data daily, I guess, um, how reliable do you think planning data is at the moment? Well, it's one of those things that differs as you go around the country and every local authority is different. And I think the standardization that could be government led would be a, a massive step forward for the industry. Um, I was only just a couple of days ago having a, a LinkedIn conversation with some barristers who were lost in trying to find a document. And I think that he, linguistically, that is one of the differences here that the current system is all about documents and sticking them on the web so you can find them. Um, and that may be a part of the conversation about what the current system is and how we could modernise it slightly. Cross that with the fairly grand proposals that are in the white paper for everything to be digitally led, which is data, not documents per se. Um, I make a slight semantic difference between them. So there is the, the brave new world of creating standardised, I'm reading from the white paper here, standardised digitally consumable rules and data, uh, embedding all of that in interactive maps. Now, 
most local authorities have some degree of interactive map that works to varying degrees of success with their local plan. Some of those will show local uh, so planning applications, planning permissions on them. But as it gets out of local plan designation to really showing things that have been permitted and real data and permissions around the area, that the interactive maps start to struggle and really varying degrees of success as to what you can search on on a local authority's website. Now, the bad ones, um, and it, it really comes down to the, the databases behind them and the models, there are three or four main products that local authorities use. Some are very good and some are not so good. Um, the bad ones will allow you to search on a planning application reference number only. You will find the documents that relate to that application and you won't even be able to search on that property. Whereas the good ones, if you have a planning application reference, you will be able to get into the, the planning history of that property and then potentially even get onto a map and look next door and really start to understand the scenario you're looking at. So I think we need to look at what the, the current picture is and how you could make it better in the short term, which is what the government started doing last year. And these are our short term proposals for planning. And we could also look at the potential for things to change and have a massive, massive overhaul. And if you look in the white paper, the word digital is mentioned 50 or 60 times. Um, the proposals to overhaul the planning system have data and digital technology at their heart. Uh, and if they come off well, they could you know, really, really change things for the better. Good stuff. And, and Max, obviously, as someone that's quite close to all of this, what's, what's your um, view on the, the current robustness, let's say, of the planning yeah, data? That's I mean, not we have there's all access to local development plans and, and planning application data which is sort of one side of it it's also the access to raw planning data and this is still often manual siloed and as a result extremely time consuming for people to acquire manipulate manage and use um i think we're making progress so the planning and housing landscape review which came out in september 2020 released a strategy for improving access to better planning data in line with the UK's national data strategy and the UK geospatial strategy. Um, this outlined a mission for planning provision to meet the FAIR acronym, which means that it must be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So with regards to, it's it, it, it sort of depends how we look at planning data. So we see planning data as uh, local development plan data, planning application data, and any data that affects planning. So this can be constraint data, historical data, environmental data. Um, we've come on leaps and strides in the last 10 years with, with regards to opening up a lot of this data, especially with the, <clears throat> the formation of the GO6 team, which the big... <laughs> big public publicly sourced open data uh, providers os bgs coal authority hmlr etc um they've sort of started to release data along this fair principle uh the issue still seems to be with the local authorities and some of the utilities data as well and it's the provision of this data is could be considered as not falling in line with the fair acronym and there's a number of reasons for this some of which you know stuart outlined just now you know lack of agreed controlled standards differences in collection and collation and availability of data um, and there's differences in the accuracy of data uh, in different locations for different properties and different assets so i think the, the crux of the issue sort of revolves around opening up local authority data in a more usable way so i guess the the challenge then is uh, whilst all local authorities have different resource levels and different capabilities in terms of digitization and, and what's needed. Um, in the short to medium term, what can we all be doing to help fix the, the inconsistencies that we face today? Because it strikes me that whether I'm dealing with a, a, a very high value real estate transaction or moving home to the end of the road, planning data is really quite important at, at this moment in time. It's a real consideration. And if that's inaccurate or not up to date, that could have some very severe repercussions for me as either an investor or a home mover. So what can we be doing as an industry, as a collective, to help drive change and improve these inconsistencies? Anyone? 
Well, I just have to say that's got to be um, got to be government led, um, you know, to get that that consistency out there. Um, I don't know. It, it's, it's you know, it, it is, it's, it's the older computer phrase, isn't it? Rubbish in, rubbish out. Um, how it is absolutely, you know, how it is entered at the, at the, at the sort of the genesis part uh, by the local authorities is absolutely key. Um, but it is still at the moment planning data. One of the big criticisms of it is that it still is geocoded to an X Y point. Um, in fairness to Landmark, Landmark have recently improved their planning data where it does actually create a polygon now for uh, most of the larger sites, which is a big step forward. Um, but ultimately, yeah, it's got to be it's where it's recorded in the outset and the consistency of how it's recorded uh, is certainly where I would see it needs to be uh, massively improved. I think um, it also revolves around interoperability, I can never say the word, um, improving interoperability between data sets and how they can interact across the entire suite of planning data. Um, UPRNs are quite a, a good use of this, and UPRNs are now available with some of these data sets, HMLR, um, OS Master Map, which allows you to, is a common ID that allows you to link data sets in a more meaningful way. Um, I think investigating that in more detail is quite an important thing we should be doing as well. And what about um, you know, the variances in, in localised policies with, with councils as well? Is that something that we encounter frustrations with, um, particularly one for you, Stuart, perhaps? Is, um, I would imagine that across the country that, that localised policy can vary mm. dramatically from one local authority to another yeah and i think the one of the bigger issues and we might see the government start to do with it as a result of um some of the things they've done over the last year in, re in response to the pandemic that have had to make things more uh, electronic digital accessible um but it, it's because at its heart the the sort of rules and laws behind this haven't really changed since the 70s um the requirement to advertise a planning application is still to put a notice on a lamppost. It's still to put a, an advert in the local paper and write to certain key neighbours. Um, I've done some work with some local PR consultancies looking at the effectiveness of social media on um, consultation, but all of that is voluntary. Your legal fallback is piece of paper on lamppost, piece of paper in the local paper, advert in the London Gazette. Uh, I, don't know if it, I don't know if anybody's even seen or heard of the London Gazette in the last couple of decades, but it, it, none of it is relevant anymore. And it, it does need some pretty basic updating of the law for the current system, even if we look at the brave new world for the new system. And in my view, you know, scrapping notices on lampposts and papers and that kind of thing reasonably quickly, but with half an eye on the older generation who are still dependent on that. Um, and remembering that you know, if you really want to engage and get local populace involved in your development or objecting to it or that kind of thing, then effective social media is, is the way through that. Um, it was the same consultant who told me that Facebook was the over 50s and if you wanted to get, engage in the under, uh, under 30s, you needed to look at these variety of things that I'd never even heard of. So, <laughs> um, and I think just picking up on one thing Max said, it's part of this is historical data. Um, and I think that's where there's going to be a big problem. It is, it's going to be, I, I hope, relatively easy to make some quirks and modernise the way new data is inputted, um, change the way the industry is thinking overnight. But there is a huge amount of historical data um, that in my role, particularly as I work on big commercial deals and, and doing the planning due diligence on that kind of thing, trying to look at the liabilities that attach to a piece of land, um, beyond the local search system and understand it in an intelligent fashion. You can go on to, if your planning application or the thing that you're gonna look at is much beyond 2005, 2006, as councils started to um, digitize their planning registers, you, you'll be concerned. So they will have scanned some of those documents in, but the way in which they've been scanned upside down, back to front with missing pages, and then the way in which they've been named had no standard concept. Um, I went on a planning register looking at a, an early 2000s application, and we think that things in the 2000s in the last 20 years have been in the modern world, 
Um, and I got about 50 documents all called planning document and had to open them all up to even work out what on earth was in them. So it's that historical data that never ceases to be relevant unless it's removed from the search and the register completely that will continue to bother a lot of my certainly bigger commercial clients, but it will still have an effect on even householders um, running a purchase that needs some serious funding to modernize if the world going from forward from here is going to have the, the kind of technical detail and data that we're talking about because that we will then have two alternative systems a pre-2020 and a, a post-2020 that um and you need to bring the two systems into one world thanks and i guess from a consumer point of view one of the or a couple of the big challenges really is all of those historic lapsed applications um, and, and there are many many I'm sure Paul, Paul will be more aware than I about this many many um, development sites that have been approved for um, use that have never seen a spade in the ground um, that sit there on um, not not even commenced with the development and yet we face more and more applications going in every day for further development sites and you know, what, 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 what is the situation there where we find so many of these sites for development that could impact or blight an area in the view of the consumer? Um, will they happen? Won't they happen? We have a, a, a very clear government policy to build. Um, we have the implications of the Greenbelt release um, over the next five years or so. And I guess from a consumer point of view, what, what does this all mean to the average home mover? Or for commercial investor um, for the longer term. Are we going to become a shrinking island, which we are as the coasts drop away slightly, um, that ends up with almost no rural areas or green belt to view upon? Is, is that the way we're heading, do we think? Or I think uh, on certainly uh, the, the greenfield, I think one of the <laughs> It certainly likes of the Daily Ter Telegraph and uh, the campaign for the protection of rural England always refers to this, you know, concreting over the countryside. In fact, by European standards, we're an incredibly green country. Um, we're actually probably about 20% considered urban. Um, compared with the Netherlands, you'd probably be climbing up to sort of 25, 30%. So, so we are, in fact, still very green. Um, the push for development is huge. You know, my, my 30 years experience in the development industry, um, I have never seen such a strong policy shift that is pro-development uh, than the one we've currently got at the, at the moment. Um, but there's other things that are just so misunderstood. Um, you know, planning uh, data is, is so critical because it displays what is current or and historical but you've also got to be looking to the future so emerging policies such as looking at the uh, strategic housing land availability assessments those, those those are critical documents because they show intention from a landowner or developer on what they want to develop but there's they're not an app planning application so they won't be found in planning data so you know when researching a property before purchase whether it be resi or large commercial um, you've got to look at everything you've got to look at the, the strategic housing land availability assessment documents you've got to look at emerging policy it's, it's also in some areas you've got to see if the neighborhood plan uh, has gone live neighborhood plans are um, you know critically important and if they're adopted you know they all make well they do really sort of take over from the planning policy of the local authority that it sits within um so there's so much you need to look at uh, you can't really just sort of isolate one um but certainly in terms of the greenfield martin you know greenfields have never been more important to investigate um one of the other areas that is li little understood is the how critical it is for a local authority to have an auditable and defendable five-year supply of housing because in situations where they don't have that there is a presumption in favor of development so mr nasty developer can come along and be uh, very predatory uh, in those authorities that don't have them and, it, and, it, and there's a staggeringly high percentage of councils that don't have that five-year supply um, 
so yeah green fields are are vulnerable i've, I've never seen as i say back in my days when i used to be in, de in actual development and, and i used to run the land teams for large house builders we used to have two very separate departments we would have our imme immediate department which were land that could be taken forward within a three-year period and then we'd have our strategic department that would look to promote land over a 5 10 15 year period in in local authorities that don't have that five-year supply you can skip that and you can go straight for an application um, so yeah it, it, it's absolutely uh, you know the green fields are not safe uh, anymore uh, you must must investigate them this, this is sort of a question I guess <clears throat> for Paul um, is green belt land dated outdated in some way because I know it, sort of, it came through under the town and planning act in 1947 mm. wasn't it to sort of protect against post-war urban sprawl yeah. And a lot of people object to opening up a green belt for a motive reason. Well, I think there are, there are cases of councils. I believe it was the chief planning officer of Newcastle who, who hated it because it was an absolute stranglehold on, on the city. It doesn't allow it to naturally expand. Um, but I think it, it's, it's the myth of green belt that, that you know, green belt, there should be a strong presumption against development. But yet there are cases, I would guess, in every local authority that has a green belt where it is being released. It is still there to be promoted. It is not absolutely 100 percent safe. Um, there are green belt reviews happening in, you know, in every uh, council that has them. So, you know, they're, they're, they're not eternally safe. And yes, I do think it's very dated. Um. <laughs> so, so I guess the, the, with the, uh, the the current high drive for for development and the risks to our, our green belt land and everything else, are we um, are we likely to see some of these uh, previously listed sites for development just remaining idle or? I guess the, the question for, for you really is, you know, we have this very high demand for housing. We have lots of development sites that are listed that haven't commenced, yet we are still making applications in full greenfield land. Um, and yet, I, I personally, where I live, I know there's a, a large application that's been put in not so long ago for a, an area of greenfield, but yet there are un commenced sites nearby. I, I, I don't understand the, the nature of the beast with the developers and stuff like that, but it does concern me that we're almost hoovering up every possible option without actually building. So um, how, how, do, how does that? Well, I think, I think that the, the developers have always been accused of, of land banking. Um, now that's something I would always defend them on because you can only build to a sales rate um, you, 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 if you can sell for a month, you build for a month. That's just simple economics and cash flow management. Um, but equally, um, we've got now, uh, you know, a dreadful issue with, with uh, skills shortage. Um, you, to actually get a site mobilised is, is not as easy as you think it would. And of course, with issues now with with Brexit affecting, uh, you know, where some of perhaps some of our trades would have come from Europe. Um, it's now not not so easy for them to do that. So we're actually we, we have made it more difficult for ourselves. But um, yeah, developers will have to build to a sales rate. Um, they don't want to start competing with themselves. Um, and plus, you know, to engineer and actually get a site ready for development. In some cases, it, it can take many, many years. So um, it, it's, 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 not, it's not as simple as just saying, let's go on everything and see them built. But um, you, you, as I say, you've got to see it from the economic point of view. Um, a, a developer would not have, if, it, if it's currently a large developer, whether it be a Crest Nicholson, a Persimmon or, or somebody, let's say they build 10, 12,000 units uh, every year, you can't suddenly make them build 16 18,000 units a year because they don't have the labor force even within their headquarters to cope with that um, it's got to be uh, a, a steady uh, planned growth it was kind of critical to the Letwin review wasn't it that um, which pretty much said what you've just said there but the politicians then ignored their own recommendations and and findings that uh, that Sir Oliver went into um, but his, his key finding there, is, as I recall it, is two or three years old now, is that 
the more you can create mixed tenure sites and different kinds of products, because then you're not competing like for like developer with each other, move on to starter homes, build to rent, uh, different forms of ownership rather than just one traditional, I own my plot of land, the, then the more you're going to get people building at a, a different pace because they're all catering to different markets rather than one. And the kind of developers you mentioned there do all cater to a similar kind of audience. You need to get people building. And that's where I think the work that Homes England are doing and, and other social providers and arms of the government in terms of freeing that up will be interesting. Um, I know Homes England have funds and schemes to release difficult sites. Um, what they're doing will be, will be interesting on that front. Are there any particular areas, Stuart, where you've seen a big increase in um, an application? So I, I'm thinking uh, perhaps a couple of years ago, there was a huge appetite for investment in student accommodation, uh, for example. Is, is that diminished and is it more now residential development or what, what sort of things are we hearing a lot of noise about in the markets at the moment? It's possible. It's probably a little bit difficult to say it's diminished because, I mean, certainly we've got big audiences in both build to rent for students and build to rent for um, retired living. Um, I think retired living has, I mean, by that I don't just mean care homes, although clearly there's a key audience there in care homes. Uh, I mean the sort of new purpose built thing where you, you move in at not much past 55, but you move into a nice service flat with good facilities and you slowly, slowly add on care as you actually hit old age. But in the first 10, 20 years of being in that serviced um, apartment, you are just in a very nice serviced apartment without realising what you're in. And by the time you get to the stage where you need it, you've got facilities around you. Now, that kind of higher end, higher tier um, serviced retirement living is, is a big um, surge forward, because I think if you compare the UK to something like the American market, we have sort of one or two percent provision to their 15 and we have an aging population so it will have to be catered for uh, we also clearly have a growing student population now it's unclear what the future of both of those kind of products is until we realize what the new normal is after uh, after the various lockdowns because i've you know we've, we've all heard horror stories from people who thought they were in very nice serviced apartments that aren't so nice when none of the facilities are capable of being provided because of the lockdown restrictions. Um, so I suspect, you know, only time will tell as to what the future of those is, but the, the markets in both were booming before the restrictions had to be applied for, for coronavirus. I guess, I, I mean, the reason I ask that really is leading on from that. I wonder whether in terms of the, the, the typical residential home movers, for example, when we consider planning data um, and the detail contained within, is there an argument to say perhaps that we need more readily available detail? And I, I, I know we talked the other day sure, about the, the ruling on the Section 73s, but if I know there's a development at the end of the road where I'm planning to move to, um, how important does it become for me to understand whether that is retirement living, uh, student built to rent, um, shared accommodation. You know, I mean, how much detail should be made available through planning data? That's, that's the, I guess, one of the million dollar questions. Well, I'm a great believer in education is key to most of these things. For my clients that have difficult developments, if they can find, and that's one of the reasons of working with particular PR consultants and engaging through social media, the more you can educate people about what you're doing. Most of these developments don't cause harm they cause the fear of harm and it's the way in which that perception is handled um you, know, you could have the worst set of students next to you but you fear them more than what the reality is particularly if a good student housing provider comes in and puts a sort of management plan in you know de deals with the noise and other issues I, I did just want to sort of rewind something you said a couple of minutes ago about you don't know if the planning permission is live because the spade's been put in the ground and it in terms of the data conversation you're having, it's whether or not that um, data is even necessarily in a local authority's hands and how we get it out of the, the people that have it. And a couple of when I was in local authority work, we went out to a, a field on the edge of a, a seaside town, kicked away at the grass and did find two concrete footings that have been down, put down in exactly the right place. That field then had a live permission for 200 houses that the 
had almost fallen out the back of a cupboard in a developer's um, archive. I'm not sure if the, the 70s permission was even still recorded on the local search. There might be an argument here for the government to bring in the kind of tidy up and um, common sense move forward that they did with um, Church Tide only a few years ago, um, of, of sort of saying, look, use it or lose it. Um, if you've got a permission that's over five years old, we'll give an amnesty period of the next 18 months, present your evidence, tell us that it's been uh, commenced, um, and you'll have a lawful development certificate. Because what I've done with, with several where that evidence falls out the back of the cupboard is get lawful development certificates. But those are often for permissions that the council had kind of assumed had gone away. Um, and if the council had assumed it had gone away, there is no way they would be putting it on any live data map. So it's then for the developer to protect their interest by getting it on the map um, and for others around it to understand what it is. So if you had a, in, the, in my local authority example, an example of uh, 200 houses from the 70s, how would that have ever got represented on the kind of map where you move in, assume you've got a, a view over a local, uh, over a field that ends in a view off a cliff and over, over the seaside? you wouldn't be expecting 200 houses to pop up, which could lawfully do so. So, I, yeah, the, the amnesty idea sort of comes to me, um, whether that's that as an example. And just the, the other thing Paul just mentioned, uh, I've just done a quick Google. Um, it's as little as 8 or 9% of the UK is actually built on at the moment. Uh, so in responding to that green belt point, no, I, I don't think we're anywhere near building on too much of the UK. The problem is where you locate it and the sensitivities of it. I completely agree with what Paul said. It, the Greenbelt policies as they've got to are a stranglehold on the communities that should be capable of expanding because the government also talks about sustainable development, sustainable living. Well, if you strangled your development down to that, which is where all your bus stops and your trains and everything else and your connectivity is, then you need to just allow it to expand a little bit and then potentially say, well, that, that's that settlement now, and it's, it's allowed to get that much bigger, um, rather than the fear, and a lot of it is down to education, because the, the fear in the headline is, we're, we're going to concrete over the UK. Well, if 8 or 9% of the UK is built on it at most, we're not going to concrete over it anytime soon. 60% um, is, is farmland, 10% of the UK is peat bog, so it is understanding which bits can be built on, in a safe way, because you clearly wouldn't want to build a house on a peat bog, it wouldn't be there very long, would it? But I'm sure some people might try, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, just um, to, to add on that though, of course, you know, there are um, picking up on Stuart's point now that you know, you, you use it or lose it, but, you know, but you can't force a developer's hand if you are in perhaps part of the country which is more economically challenged. How do you force a developer to go ahead and commence construction on a site that they're very fearful of getting a, a successful sales rate? You know, um, we, we've uh, an example we've had recently was down in Folkestone in Kent, where thanks to the planning data, it actually revealed a historic planning application on a beach for over a thousand flats. Um, and what you what, what the, the property that somebody was buying had a sea view, um, but right in, right in front of that sea view was this unimplemented dated planning consent for a thousand flats. Very easy, perhaps, in, to go back and reinstate it, but we don't see that development happening anytime soon mm. because that is not um, economically exciting to a developer to build a thousand flats in one location. And Folkestone isn't, um, you know, the center of London where you could get away with that. So it, it, chances are you've got to wait for a real boom in, in the British economy before the developer would find that uh, an appetizing site to acquire. I think this really is also the difficulty well. the, um, that they've got, isn't it? That the, there are areas that are popular and people want to live and buy in, um, but they're not necessarily where the land is available. Uh, and that's why the, the government's standard landing, uh, housing land supply calculations are so skewed towards the south, where the bulk of the population lives at the moment, that there are good bits of land available in the Midlands and the north that aren't necessarily as popular because the sales values aren't there either. I think that's a really pertinent point that, that Paul makes there. And it, I think it leads on to the, uh, the question. It's, it's not just about the historic applications and the uh, historic data, is it? it? It's actually about the... Uh, the potential for a developer to make a successful 
commercially successful um, development. And and I think I know you do quite a lot of work on this for when you're you're running your reports. But it's for example the MOD land and things like that 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 are attractive for developers that do offer good commercial returns versus those where perhaps they've been granted consent, but it may never happen. Um, and that's one of the challenges, I guess, for the consumer. If I simply have uh, some planning data that tells me that there's a, a potential for a big development at the end of the road, it's only part of the story, isn't it? it it's more about, is that development ever likely to happen and what type of development will it be? Mm. Um, and, and, and again, I think um, when we were talking about the, the, the variation of um, conditional consents uh, the other day, Stuart, it's, it's, it, it's not easily or readily apparent to most consumers what a development entails, is it? No, and the example you're talking about there, I'll, I'll repeat it for, for the sake of today's audience, is if you make a planning application, your planning application would be for something, I don't know, for instance, 50 houses. Uh, 50 houses in outline with access reserved, something like that. Um, you might then, through what's called the Section 73 uh, uh, system, want to amend a condition. Uh, let's say your drainage conditions doesn't suit what it needs to be, or you need to tweak an outline or some of the plans. Plans is one of the most common ways of doing this. If you put your application in, the description of development will become variation of condition one to amend plan. And on that section 73, it won't say anything about what the development actually is. You could then have a series of permissions running through the data sheet, for want of a better term, on, on the online portal that just refer to what condition has been varied. And man on the street would look at that and go, well, variation of all these conditions, what's the development? Well, actually, the development is still the same. Those are four different permissions for different versions of a 50 house housing estate. But how do you understand without plowing through all of the documents on them and trying to compare and it's not even looking at the plans on one application you would have to find a way of comparing the plans on each of those four applications to understand that those 50 houses are bungalows those 50 houses have added dormers to them um, and this one over here has got sheds on uh, and garages on them and that's the difference and it, it's trying to make that in an accessible sort of transparent form for for anybody to understand yeah it's interesting you say that actually so this this does highlight the importance of public opinion in planning and I was shocked actually to find out so well so beginning of 2020 um, we competed in the Mayor of London Civic Innovation Challenge which was to democratize planning data so the crux of that was less than half of the UK's population can actually read a local plan can read a planning application properly and this leads to around a third of planning applications receiving enough objections from the local public or communities to actually halt the progression of those planning applications. So the whole, the whole purpose of the Civic Innovation Challenge was in London specifically, um, it was then to be rolled out to the UK, whoever won, won, the, um, won the grant, but uh, it was to make planning applications more accessible and understandable to the local public. So there are a lot of different ideas that were thrown about with regards to that and some were involving using 3D BIM models or just using 3D data to represent what a plan will actually look like. Because you look at the plan on a, local, on a planning application and unless you're an architect, it's pretty hard to understand. So I was looking at them, they're quite hard to understand initially. So being able to represent that 3D in 3D enables the public to potentially understand what a development's gonna look like and also providing sort of social and environmental impacts in a more clear way, um, plus social social portals. So having linking planning applications to social media and allowing communities to actually come together and discuss what the impacts of potential planning developments might be. Um, so it's an interesting one. I mean, the, the, the company that won it were actually looking at BIM models and providing 3D data to visualize planning applications. And I'm not sure how far that's actually come on, but. Um, the plan was to roll that out in London to a lot of the London boroughs and then potentially move it nationwide. So it was, it was quite an interesting um, thing to be a part of and quite relevant, I guess, to what you guys are talking about there. It's interesting that you roll it out in London first because I've seen a few planning obligations, 106s come about recently where a developer has asked and 
you know, in the grand scheme of the development is not a lot of money, you know, a few hundred quid, but the few hundred quid goes to putting that application on the interactive London map. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure what the interactive London map is. Maybe, maybe you know better than I, but it, it's not something I don't think that exists outside of London, but developments in London are asked to pay the costs of getting their development data into that map. Um, as opposed to developments outside of London, which where a map doesn't really even exist. The, the point, there's a massive difference. The, Max, you, you know, you've made a very relevant point here, and this is why, back to the, our key subject here, planning data, why it is so critical. The British public hate change. Um, um, it was actually the, the Institute of Economic Affairs, they actually ran a statistic and it was 95% of people are actually concerned about development. But that's why it's important to educate them that actually some developments will actually bring up an area, they will actually positively enhance it um, and probably add value to their properties. Um, losing a view, perhaps that is more sensitive, but it's important to balance the risk of development with the impact, um, and, you know, and that's something we always look to do with ours is to educate people. Yes, there is a risk here. Yes, there would be some construction nuisance, but long term, there's absolutely no impact on your property at all. Um, but there's this knee jerk reaction, certainly from the public, that any development is, is going to decrease values in their, in their area. And that, and that just quite simply is not the case. Yeah, so much of it is down to educating others what our industry does and works in. Um, it's local elections next week. I've had a questionnaire through. I won't mention the party. Um, but it asks me what my, my concerns are. And in the top five tick boxes, it says provide much needed affordable housing um, and stop development or stop unneeded development nearby. And immediately the sort of the planning lawyer and the sort of developer's friend in me, those two things don't mix. We need to be freeing up the right developable areas to provide affordable housing for those in need of it. Um, and that is affordable housing in the market and in the affordable housing market uh, as distinct products, but both things, because more commercial housing mm. means the market is, is busier and housing itself becomes more affordable because there's more of it. Yeah, you're right. You know, it is. It's an absolute vote winner for, for local delegates is to campaign on the back of I'm here to stop development, um, which completely flies in the face of everything that's coming out from central government, in, you know, in the national planning policy framework, which was basically telling local authorities, get your head out the sand and start building. Um, and, and it has made a big difference, as we've discussed, you know, we are seeing more greenfield releases than than I've ever seen. Um, mm. and, in spite of my pro-development background, I actually don't like it because I, I come from uh, a background where we used to build a lot on, on the brownfield sites. Um, and there is still a considerable amount of urban land that could hit the housing numbers, but it's so much easier to promote a large field for development uh, where your build costs will be less. Um, and to find a willing landowner, uh, find a farmer that has two choices, sell at 15,000 an acre or sell at one and a half million an acre. I know which one I'd choose. <laughs> yeah. Just on a much smaller scale then, what about um, permitted development? Um, I mean, how much does, obviously there's no data available for permitted development because it doesn't exist, but how much could that impact? Is that, is that something we need to educate your average residential home mover about because you know there's a couple of scenarios there isn't that a i can foresee someone buying a lovely property with a nice big sunny patio and finding you know six months after moving in that both neighbors have extended out and suddenly it's no longer a sunny patio or the flip of that you might find yourself um looking at property thinking oh this would be really nice i could put a, a nice extension on the back and then find out there's an article four invoked by the, the council you know these things are minefields for our, mm. our home movers and i don't think there's anywhere near enough information available or readily available about permitted development i don't know what your views yeah. are on that but there, there is data available it is again it's how it's accessed and how it's produced so an article four direction if you do a local search on a property it will show up but the question is what are you searching because does the article four direction end next door or in your garden or where does it come up and as a result of that how do you understand what the effect of that is? Some of those Article 4 directions are old and badly drafted and don't always mean what they think they mean. 
Um, permitted development rights, again, there is data out there as to what you can do in a standard scenario. So if you looked at something like the Planning Portal's interactive house and interactive tool, you could look at next door and produce yourself a worst case scenario very quickly. So I don't know if the data is capable of being extracted from that tool and put into the kind of GIS mapping systems we're talking about where you could say, well, that's next door. That's the worst case for next door if they exercise all of their permitted development rights, exercise, extended by a couple of metres, put the shed down the bottom of the garden, built the biggest patio they could, um, those kind of things. So that there is data there. It's how it merges with the different systems and what the reality is. I think the other thing to, to mention here is the is things that aren't development. So, and that then is where you come to educating public and users of the system. So agricultural uses have never been development. So you could get a very unpleasant use next door when you thought you had a green field. Alternatively, you've got the, the changes to use class E that have come in recently. Um, so you might think you've got a shop next door, but it could be a dance studio, it could be uh, a variety of other things, offices and other things, because the change to use class E means there's no development, and no development is a bit different to permit development. The other thing with permitted development that could be captured is a number of them, aside from household rights, and some household rights still do have a prior approval, but most of them don't, they have prior approval decisions. So those decisions are very similar in appearance to uh, planning permission and the detail in that could be captured in some way as well so if you've got an office that's converting to residential you can see the plans that have been through the prior approval system with the council and they could be captured in a in a database or a data-led system yeah it seems it seems there's a lot of information out there but as, as you've said a couple of times now Stuart it's, it's about accessing that data isn't it it's just not um I guess it, it, it's not as easy or readily accessible as perhaps it, it could or should be. Um, and that's probably the crux of the issue all around, whether it's permitted development, whether it's um, um, land listed for development, greenfield release, all of those things. It's just, it, it's probably, there's lots of data, swathes of data, but all in different places. Um, and, and somehow we need to be able to pull it together um, easily and quickly. Yeah. The, um, just to add on to that, um, was to look at you know, the problem with planning data is that it is just regurgitated data. That is it. There's no interpretation of it. Um, that is something we do. We go through the data, we extract what is relevant, um, but it is also subjective. We've only got to look back um, a few years ago when Bird and Bird were um, you know, challenged on, um, they went through some planning data, that was the mistake they made, was that they actually reported on it themselves to the client, told the client there was nothing to worry about. After the client had exchanged contracts to purchase, found out that there was a large development nearby and refused to complete. Um, and, and they got all of their costs and deposit awarded and it was you know, about a 2 million PI claim against them. So interpreting planning data by professionals that actually understand it uh, is absolutely, uh, it's so, so critical. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of goes to, uh, to um, <clears throat> local authorities and their, how they see data and geospatial data. Um, a lot of these local authorities sort of view geospatial data as a cost to be minimised rather than an actual investment that helps to under, underpin efficient planning. Um, so it's getting local authorities to understand the value of data, I think, because you have, like we've sort of discussed previously, the discrepancy between sub-local authorities, some are very geospatially enabled and they have like a champion within their department that is pushing for that data to be released. And some still provide PDFs. And that's quite telling if you've got that, that sort of discrepancy between two local authorities. So it's, I think the, the emphasis on geospatial data is quite important. Good, gents, I'm going to try and wrap up there because I'm conscious of everyone's lunch hour uh, coming to a close. So just uh, before I invite questions, um, first of all, thank you very much to all of our panel. Really enjoyed that very interesting session, lots of interesting points to come out. Um, clearly data isn't the answer on its own. There's, there's lots more to it as, as we've all discussed today. Uh, just going to go around to each of you and see if there's one key takeaway you'd like to share with the group before we invite questions. So uh, I'll start off, Max, is there anything uh, one, one thing you'd like to share with the group before we conclude today? Uh, I guess we can size. So 
if all planning data was fair, follow the FAIR principle acronym, then that would go a long way to resolving a lot of the issues we're facing at the moment. Good, thanks. Stuart, anything, uh, one thing you'd like to share maybe? I think my key take home at the moment is, is education is key uh, and the data is only as good as the person inputting it and that comes back to their perception and education on what we're trying to do with it. Good, good. And Paul, yourself? Um, what I would love to see would be to see planning data adopted by the Law Society as a compulsory report um, before purchase. Um, educating and forcing people to take this information would make for better informed property decisions before people buy. Agreed, good. Fantastic, thanks gents. I'm just gonna open up to the, the floor then as anyone's got any questions, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, you've got a Q&A section or a chat section. Please feel free to uh, just pop anything into those uh, Q&As and we'll, we'll open them up to the panel. So we'll, they're open now, just uh, we'll have a few moments and see if anyone has any questions for the group. Okay, it looks like we might have got off right there, gents. I don't think there's any questions coming in immediately. If you do have questions after the session, any of our attendees, please feel free to send them in and we will look to answer those. I have got one here. Um, as it currently stands, is the potential for planning data to negatively, brackets or positively, affect house prices? Is the potential for EAs to use this? So I guess the question there is, um, well, yes, plan planning data could negatively or positively affect houses, but I'll open up to the, the panel. How do we think that could impact on, on property prices? Um, Paul, it's something that you've, you've worked with quite a lot, so yeah, perhaps you want to start data. off on that one? If, 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 if that planning data does reveal a planning application, a development that could impact the value of a property, um, well, it's absolutely critical that you know about it before you go ahead and purchase. Um, and we do have situations where we would uh, recommend in our reports that something is referred back to the valuer uh, and the valuer must have the last word as to whether that development is going to um, impact its value. So planning data can affect value, yes. I think Any the, thoughts, um, Matt Stewart? Yeah, I was going to say that the CPO regime is a really good um, example of that, actually, because often the things that trigger evaluation and trigger a, a, an event in CPO are a little bit later than when the public get worried about them. So I've, I've got clients currently whose house purchases are falling through because of the CPO event, the new road or the new scheme that the council are planning nearby or even in part of the garden, hence the CPO event. But they're still consulting an option so it could be one of five things and only two of them affect this particular client um so yeah absolutely that that all goes to value and some of it and the, the way in which the data is presented and if it's presented early enough it makes a difference and in these cases um sales are falling through because it's being found out about but we're not at an early enough stage yet to do anything about it on the cpo so it's it's the way those different things sort of the, the time scales the different trains are running on different tracks unfortunately Fantastic. I think the uh, same question there basically was um, particularly where the shovel isn't in the ground yet. And uh, I think, Stuart, you've just answered that nice and eloquently for us there. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I can't see any more questions coming in at the moment. So I think what we'll do is, is we'll wrap up there. Uh, once again, thank you very much to Stuart, Max and Paul for their, uh, their joining us today. Really useful and insightful session. I hope the attendees have also enjoyed that session and uh, I wish the rest of you all a very good afternoon. So thank you very much, everyone.